Good morning, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you for joining us this morning. The presence of the Lord is in this place. But may we just bow our heads in a word of prayer as we prepare our hearts. Father, thank you for this day. This is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I was glad when they said to me, come to the house of the Lord. For Lord, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Father, it's such a privilege to be found in your house with your people singing praises. Thank you for my brothers and sisters through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for loving us the way that you do. Lord, life is a gift. Life is a gift and we only have this life to live. So, Father, teach me your ways. Speak to me. May I draw energy and strength, Lord, from you. Strengthen my inner man. Arise, spirit, within me that it may, may, may not be downcast or defeated. For I know that we are sons and daughters of the living God. That nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. We, Lord, come to you from a myriad of places, in different positions, and different seasons in which we find our lives. And at the start of this service, I pray for each one of us in the seasons in which we're going through. Think of folk who have family in hospital, and we just pray for your healing at this time. We pray for those who celebrate birthdays and enjoy another year that goes by. We thank you for those that celebrate new children and the time of our lives when we're running and dealing with nappies and little children and grandchildren. It's great, Lord. We thank you for that season. We thank you for season of love and marriage. We thank you for seasons of family. We just thank you for every season that we're in. And I know this, this beautiful congregation you've given us of flavors and colors are made up of different seasons. So, Lord, it's often difficult to know how to speak into each particular season. But I'm amazed, Lord, that your word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that when we speak your word, it speaks to us in every season of our lives. That you have promises for us in this season of dryness, in a season of plenty, a season of heartache, in a season of joy. Your word is strong and secure. So, Father, right where we sit, whatever season we're in, speak to our hearts, Lord. Lead us on this journey of life as we pilgrim from pillar to post, Lord, knowing that the finish line is in sight and that it is not long before you come to call your children home. We thank you that the signs are all around us as a woman with pregnancy pains. We pray for the Middle East and the, the land of Israel, even as you've called us to do so in your word. May there be peace on Israel. We pray for our nation. May there be peace in our nation. Father, we thank you that time will come to an end. But you hold time in your hands. Father, we thank you that you make all things beautiful in your time. And as we submit to your Holy Spirit within us, working and moving in our hearts, we say, Lord, may you be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 We go through different seasons of our lives. I was blessed to take some time last week just to go and seek the Lord. And also be filled by His Spirit and say, Lord, what, what are you saying to me as an individual and what are you saying to our church this is all in preparation perhaps for our conference, which is coming up very soon. And as you know, our conference has become a, a tipping point or almost a, a catapult of our church into a season of, of whatever God has called us to do. And last year, we had some wonderful men of God speak into our lives and into our church. Those tapes are available and it's important to review them and see what God is saying to us. We had Pastor Neville Goodchild here 
many things that they said, the men that were here, have not yet fully been realized in our church. If you remember, our theme of our conference was Love Unleashed. And I believe God still wants to unleash His love on us, His people. We long to feel His love. We long to be strengthened in His love. We're at a tipping point in our nation right now where that there is no answer but the love of Christ. There is no answer save Jesus alone. I praise God that there are men behind the scenes that are praying for our nation and can speak to people in positions of authority. And that there are men called by God. There are many men who, who still bend their ear to God and say, Speak to me, Lord, for this nation. So I believe this year our conference will continue in the same theme because that theme has yet to be realized. And that is the love unleashed in our nation. And as I was pondering this in our vision, our vision once again to remind you is releasing for God's glory His flavors and colors into the world. We are the flavors and the colors. We are the ones that need to release His glory into the world. God has chosen you. You might think, well, I'm not a very nice flavor. Listen, we need all flavors. We need the chili flavors to the bitter flavors, to the sweet, to the sour. You know, lemon has its place. You know, the chilies have their place. Together we make beautiful flavors for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we have the different colors from every shade under the sun. And God is calling us to release His glory. Some of us sit here, we feel inadequate. We feel, what can I do? What more can I do? When we think of our lives, yesterday I was preparing for our children to come back from camp. And we did a few changes in our home to surprise them and just make the house a little better. And I knew they'd probably want to come for a swim, so I was sweeping the leaves out of the pool with a scoop. Now, if you know what the day was like yesterday, it was a bit of a fruitless exercise. <laughs> scoop the leaves, and before you know it, that wind blows, and there's more leaves in the pool. You scoop the pool, and there's more leaves in the pool. After all, I was like, oh, what am I doing here? Working against the wind. And I began to think of all that God has been speaking to me about and, and thinking of our lives here in Zimbabwe and thought, how many of us are really thinking, is life worth it? Are we going around the same treadmill, scooping leaves out and emptying, and then it just gets messed up again? Some of us feel perhaps we're on a treadmill, just going over the same things. Same patterns, are things going to change in my status, in my home, in my marriage, in my country? And we just do things over and over. Is it worth it? Is life worth living? Is there something more for us? And these are the questions that we begin to think about. And in turning to them while I was away for a few days, I began to read through a book written by one of the wisest men who ever walked this world. Aside from Jesus, and that man was Solomon. And Solomon wrote a book called the book of Ecclesiastes. And we have in our position a considered response to this basic question about life. And even today, I think a lot of what he said is misunderstood or ignored. And the book I'm talking about is the book of Ecclesiastes. This book goes beyond other wisdom literature to emphasize the fact that human life and human goals as an end in themselves and apart from God are fruitless and meaningless. That anything we do apart from God is fruitless and meaningless. This year we've said our theme is to seek the kingdom of God above all else. To align our hearts with Him. We live in a fallen world and our mind often gets caught up with the trappings of this world. Our thinking gets into alignment with the thinking of our neighbors and we start to complain and we start to moan and everything becomes a problem. We find ourselves frustrated by situations, lack of money, businesses falling around us, 
Now, our hearts are to do right, but it seems everything comes to naught. And we can ask ourselves, is it for nothing? Maybe even here in the church. You've come to church. You've worked in the church. You've done things in the church. And maybe the ministry you are hoping to come to fruition. As you know, this year we've been working on our giftings. Maybe you had big ideas. I want to start an evangelism uh, a mission, an outreach mission. I want to get to heal people. I want to do this. And you found that at the beginning of the year, your heart was excited. And we come to a place where you feel like nothing's happening. Am I speaking to anybody this morning? We wonder where are we going, what's going on. We spoke about the bigger picture and the smaller picture. And sometimes we get confused. What is the bigger picture? In Ecclesiastes, reading from verse 1, chapter 1, sorry, verses 2 to 11, I'd like to take a few passages and bring to our mind where we've come from and what we can expect to happen. I see faces of people around me who are in current leadership and those who were in leadership and those who are training to be in leadership. And we look at the same cycles of things. We wonder where we're going. I suppose it's the same with eating. You know, we, we make breakfast every morning. I know sometimes my wife thinks, yeah, I have to cook again. Is it supper time again? You know, we think we've got to go through the motions. We cook breakfast, we cook supper, and another day we wake up, we go to school, we go to work. Where does it lead? Another day. And so Solomon was pondering these questions. These are questions we don't often talk about and ask. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And he's referring to himself as a teacher because Solomon, in writing this book, he was at the end of his age. And it's a reflections or, 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 or um, discussions of a man who's lived through a lot, who's had everything at his disposal. And he's looking back and saying, tell me, what is life really about? Some of our congregation hang on the precipice between life and death. We look back and say, what is life all about? And he says, everything is meaningless, says the teacher. Completely meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come, generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south, then it turns north, around and around it goes. Blowing in circles, rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. The water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. History merely repeats itself. All that has been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Sometimes people say, here's something new, but actually it's old. Nothing is truly ever new. We don't remember what happened in the past, and in the future generations, no one will remember what we are doing now. And let's be honest, sometimes it feels like that. Do we ever learn from history? You know, it's, it's nearly 200 years since the end of the Second World War. And I was watching a documentary, a First World War, sorry, and we were watching a documentary on, on the First World War, and they still had pictures and footage of, of some of the, the Battle of the Somme, for example. And they were talking about, do people even remember what happened in that war? There are people today who refute what happened in, in World War II, that, that many Jews were killed in concentration camps. So people don't want to learn from history. History just repeats itself and repeats itself. Are we even learning the lessons of our country's history? Do we look back and say, what about this country, Zimbabwe? Have we learned lessons from history? Or are we just repeating the same things over and over again? But you know, I'm encouraged because there is a time for everything. We live in an instant generation where people are looking for instant answers. And God does sometimes do that. You know, miracles, instant healings. But more likely than not, life is not made up of instant. It's made up of process. We spoke about the pilgrim's progress and the journey. We've got to look back and say, how far have we come? What have we done? Look at how far your children have grown up. And what God has done in their lives. And how far we've come as a church. We jump to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 to 14. And there's that famous passage which we know in song, 
But I want to remind you again, because there is a time for everything. For everything, there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven. There's a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant, a time to harvest. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to cry and a time to laugh. A time to grieve and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones, a time to gather stones. A time to embrace a time to run away, a time to search and a time to stop searching, a time to keep, a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be quiet and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What do people really get for all their hard work? I have seen the burden God has placed on us all. Verse 11, yet God has made everything beautiful in his own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. What is that saying? He has planted eternity in the human heart. It means that in every single heart on this planet, God has placed a God-shaped vacuum that can only be filled by God. There's an eternity, a longing for something more than ourselves that God has positioned in each and every one of us. There's an eternity that's been placed in our hearts. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. So I concluded there is nothing better than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can. People should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor, for these are gifts from God. Now know that whatever God does is final. Nothing can be added or taken from it. God's purpose is that people should fear Him. So Solomon's looking and he's saying, I've seen many things happen. Solomon was a man who had everything at his disposal. And, and, and uh, the next section I wanted to talk about was wealth, works, wisdom in our world. As Solomon talks through all these topics in the book of Ecclesiastes. We're not going through the whole thing now. But I'm, I'm going to come to a conclusion where I think that it will help us all in our understanding of where we are now and what's going through the times that we're living in. Because I think we're all asking for answers. We're all looking for something more. Believers, non-believers. We're all asking the hard questions. And each of those areas that Solomon speaks into resonates deeply within us and right into our current situation. I'm going to talk about a few of them. Here's one of them he says in Ecclesiastes 5, verses 13 to 19. And I'm really enjoying reading a lot of the Scripture this morning. And I hope that you enjoy it as well, because the Scriptures teach us things. Now remember, not everything that Solomon said was true. It's true that he said it, but what he said often wasn't true. For example, I can say, the sun is green. Was it true? The pastor said the sun is green. Yes, it's true. He said that. But is the sun green? No, it's not. You see, so sometimes we read things and it's true that he said them, but some of those things need to be analyzed and say, but is it what he said, is it true? So very often we can take the book of Ecclesiastes out of context because we're taking something that Solomon is musing through before he gets to his conclusion and says, this is what God says. Actually, no, it's not what God says. It's what Solomon was thinking as he was working through the process of his, of his life. Does this make sense? And for each of us, this is important to understand. We're not perfect, and we all wrestle with issues. We wrestle, why did I do this? Why did this fail when I hoped it would succeed? Why is this not working out? Why are my children turning away from God? And we struggle with questions in our hearts. And we say things that we don't really mean. And we do things that we don't really want to do. And we look back and reflect. And this is what Solomon is doing, he's reflecting. And he says in chapter 5, verses 13 to 19, and I think it's good for us to read this because we can relate to this stuff. Here's another serious problem I have seen under the sun. Hoarding riches harms the saver. Money is put in risky investments that turn sour and everything is lost. And in the end, there's nothing left to pass on to our children. What are we leaving for our children? What is our nation leaving as a legacy for our children? He says, we all come to the end of our lives as naked and empty-handed as the day we were born. We can't take 
our riches with us. That may be news for somebody here today. Hello? You can get all the money you want, but you're not going to take it with you. All And this, too, is a very serious problem. People leave this world no better off than they came in. All their hard work is for nothing, like working for the wind. Throughout their lives, they live under a cloud, frustrated, discouraged, and angry. Even so, I've noticed one thing. At least that is a good thing, that people eat, drink, and enjoy their work under the sun during their short life God has given them, and to accept their lots in life. And it is a good thing to receive wealth from God and to enjoy well, uh, health and enjoy it. To enjoy our work and accept your lot in life is indeed a gift from God. Yeah, we see him talking about money. He's saying, what do we do with our money? Are we so busy chasing money that we don't realize that... I, I know people who are so busy chasing money, by the time they want to enjoy it, their family is disintegrated. The children have left home. The wife doesn't want any interest. And he's saying, but I've worked so hard for this, and there's nothing left. And he says, take time to enjoy your family. Brothers and sisters, we need to take time, not just rushing through life, but realizing, I've got children. I've got a wife. I've got friends. I've got people that I need to stop and take time and enjoy company with them. Don't get so busy that we're turning away from people. This world has become so hectic, we don't have time for one another. We think it's okay to give a Facebook message or a WhatsApp, and that's it. Before we know it, our mom's gone. Our friends have gone. And we think, uh, if only I had spent a little bit more time with them. If I'd only had spoken a little bit more with them. Now they're gone. Can't get it back. You only have one life to live. It's no dress rehearsal. This is it. This is it. We came in naked, naked we go. We get those guys who amass m money for their children, and their children who didn't work for it squander it. So these are questions we begin to think about. What, what's actually important in our life? What about marriage? Uh, th this, is, this is really what caught my attention is when I was away, the Olympics were on and we were watching some of the Olympics. Did you enjoy some of that Olympics? Some of you who watched it? It was interesting. I, get, I managed to catch a few races. Watching that Hussein Bolt is just like crazy. You know, when you see the human body move like that and you think, man, they're so strong. But you know, the strongest doesn't always win the race. Fast, the fastest doesn't always win. And so that caught my attention. And it says this in Ecclesiastes verses nine, chapter 9, verses 9 to 12. I've got two more portions I want to read, read and then bring it to, to the conclusion. He says this. Live happily with the woman you love. Amen. Can I say that again? Live happily with the man you love. Okay. Now that's a good thing. I like what he says there. Through all the meaningless days that God has given you under the sun. Because sometimes every day just seems like another meaningless day. But at least I've got a woman to love. At least I've got a man to love. Amen? For the wives. At the end of the day, I've got my man. I've got my woman. God has given me something that, that I can treasure. Okay? For you who are not yet married, just uh, that's for the future. Okay. For when you go to the grave, there will be no work or planning or knowledge of wisdom. And I observe something else under the sun. The fastest runner doesn't always win the race. And the strongest warrior doesn't always win the battle. The wise sometimes grow hungry. And the skillful are not necessarily wealthy. And those who are educated don't always lead successful lives. It's all decided by chance, by being in the right place at the right time. I put this on our Men's Connect group and it started some good conversation going. Got people thinking. It says that people can never predict when hard times might come. Like a fish in a net or birds in a trap, people are caught by sudden tragedy. Isn't that just life? You know, there we are walking along life and suddenly we get a phone call out the blue. Some of you are sitting here and know exactly what I'm talking about. Your life has changed forever. One car accident, the life has changed forever. One sudden death, the life has changed forever. Like a bird caught in a trap. And suddenly, God, what's going on? You know? I'm supposed to be a mighty warrior, and yet I'm not finishing well. 
I'm supposed to be this strong person, but things aren't working out for me. And these are questions that, that we're asking and we're pondering. God, it's not fair. How come the wicked seem to prosper, but the honest seem to be punished? Did I hear a giggle there? Lord, this is not fair. How long, oh Lord, must this carry on for? Something's got to change. We are your children, Lord. We seem to be struggling. Struggling with my faith. You know, Solomon is Old Testament, but we can take a lot of this into our lives today. We're struggling with issues. We're struggling with our faith. We struggle with our relationships. We're asking the hard questions. It just doesn't seem fair. And even though we, we're claiming the Scriptures and we're walking in your way, not every person I pray for gets healed, Lord. What's going on? Sometimes I pray for somebody, they end up dying. I remember my dad saying that one time. Prayed for somebody, end up dying. He said, oh, that's the last time I want to pray for anybody. <laughs> but sometimes that happens. Come on, church. This is life. Is what life's about. And that's why we gather together. And I'm so glad that we're all together as believers saying, Lord, this is a crazy world in which we live. But there's got to be more. Otherwise, what are we doing on this treadmill? And this is not just a message for a non-believer. It's for us because we're the ones who struggle with it the most. Because we ought to be seeing things happen that are not happening. We spoke about the supernatural and walking in the supernatural and breaking bread together and doing things that God has called us to do. And yet when we face those burials and, and those disappointments, it's like, ah, oh, what's going on? Young people, I wasn't talking about you earlier, but I'm talking about you now. He says in ver chapter 11, verse 9, Young people, it's wonderful to be young. Enjoy every minute of it. Do everything you want to do. Take it all in. But remember that you must give an account to God for everything you do. Hello? He doesn't say just do what you want to do, full stop. He says do what you want to do. In other words, you're young. Enjoy God while you're young. Get excited about God. And remember that everything you do, you will have to give an account for Him. One day. And so among all the other things that Solomon spoke about, he saw injustice to the poor, crooked politicians, incompetent leaders, guilty people being allowed to commit more crime, materialism, a desire for the good old days. Kevin spoke about it earlier. It sounds relevant for us today, doesn't it? But don't assume that Solomon is being cynical or pessimistic in all of this. You would miss the point. When he considers his wealth, his works, his wisdom, or his word, Solomon does say that vanity of vanities is a vexation of the spirit. But that's not his conclusion that he re leaves for his readers. What is Solomon's conclusion? What can we conclude from all of this? In spite of his painful encounters with the world and the problems that we encounter all the time, Solomon does not recommend pessimism or cynicism. In fact, it's interesting when you read that book. Over 17 times in the book of Ecclesiastes, there are words related to joy, enjoy, rejoice, etc. One of the things he reminds people is life is too short. Life is too short. And if we don't stop and enjoy one another, we're going to lose out on God's best for us. Sometimes we as Christians can be so, shall I say, religious or passionate about doing the work God has called us to do. I know I'm like that sometimes, that we get serious every time we're talking about God. It's serious. Like, come on. That we, whoa, whoa, hold on. Let's just enjoy God being with us. Enjoy sitting with friends. Enjoy laughing and talking and sharing with one another. Life is going too fast. We lose the ones we love and we miss out not on the intensity of our actions but on the times we sat just laughing and doing nothing. Recognizing that you're valuable, my friend. We have a life to live. Yes, work hard. Do the things you ought to do but take time for one another. 
take time to suck the marrow out of life and enjoy being with one another. Amen? I know it's like this for each of us, uh, for many of us, especially me, because you get so focus-driven, you look thinking of the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, and you miss out on the moment where you're in. And you've got to live in that moment. You're sitting with your wife on the stoop and you're chatting or you're going for a walk and you miss out on that moment because your mind is thinking about the work the next day, the problem you've got to solve. And so even though you're there, you're not there. Your family are missing you. Your children say, Dad, you're there, but you're not really there because you're too busy thinking of something else. Solomon says, take time to be there in the moment. To say, my brother, I love you and I appreciate you. Thank you for what you've done. Let's sit on the stoop and talk a little bit. Enjoy each other's company. He said, but that's not a very religious kind of service on a Sunday. It's important for us. It's important for us. Listen, Solomon doesn't say, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. That's not what Solomon says. Instead, he advises us to trust God and enjoy what we do have rather than complain about what we don't have. Enjoy what we do have. Life is short and life is difficult, so make the most of it while you can. Enjoy what you do have. He comes to the conclusions in all of this in chapter 12, verses 8 to 14, and I'm going to read it through. Give you a minute to find it, chapter 8. Sorry, chapter 12, reading from verse 8. Everything is meaningless, said the teacher. It's completely meaningless. Keep this in mind. The teacher was considered wise and taught the people everything he knew. He listened carefully to many proverbs, studying and classifying them. The teacher sought to find out just the right words to express truths clearly. And I, I related to that, you know, looking for the right words, even in preparing the message in my heart, saying, Lord, give me the right words to express your truth clearly to us today. And you start asking these questions. The words of the wise were like cattle prods, painful but helpful. Sometimes that's what the words of the Lord are like. Ah, ah. But he's saying, that's where I want you to go. Painful but helpful. Their collected sayings are like a nail-studded stick in which a shepherd drives a sheep. But my child, let me give you some further advice. Be careful, for writing books is endless and much study wears you out. That's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey His commands, for this is everyone's duty. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. And in his final conclusion and personal application, Solomon presents four pictures of life and attaches to each picture a practical admonition for his readers. And this is the four pictures of life that I'd like to leave you today. Four pictures of life. I think another thing that made me think about this was seeing the riots up in Harare. You know, this Harare is very tense at the moment. And there were stories of... of People that had actually uh, died in some of the rioting. And, you know, we, we begin to think of our mortality. We begin to think about, if my life was taken from me, what legacy have I left? What footprint have I left on the mark of time in the f 50 years, 20 years, 80 years that God has given me? What footprint am I leaving behind? We know that there is a, an eternal glory waiting for us as believers. That's our hope. That's something solid we can take with us. That as we give our lives to the Lord, we can transition beautifully into the next life because God is with us. There's no doubting God was with us. But we begin to buy, think about these things. And the four things I'd like to leave with you is, number one is, life is an adventure. Life is an adventure. Live it by faith. Go out there and live it by faith. You don't have to have, can I say to those of you who like your ducks in a row, you don't need all your ducks in a row. 
sometimes you just need to bite the bullet and go for it. It's like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to go for it. Woohoo! You only have one life to live. I remember my wife and I did that one year. I said to, to my wife, we're going to Cape Town. What? I said, we're going to Cape Town. She said, and where are you going to get money for Cape Town? I says, I don't know. I said, I've saved enough to get us to Joburg. <laughs> My kids will remember the story. I said, so you want to go to Joburg and then trust God to get you to Cape Town? So I said, well, that's it. Let's go. I heard the train tickets are cheap. You just go down to the, to the train to Cape Town. So I said, okay. So we started our journey to Cape Town. Do you know, some of you were here when I took that trip. I came back, I said I had more money in my pocket when I got back than I had before I even left. Our car broke down on the way. When I got there, a friend of mine, some of you may remember him, his name is Fred. He said, leave your car with me, I'll sort the car. When we got back, he had sorted the car and he didn't even charge us for, the, for, for fixing the car. So we had a holiday and I came back with money in my pocket. And I said, that was really crazy. Was that presumption or what? I don't know what happened there. And I was reminded again, life is an adventure. Sometimes you've got to live it. I often say to guys, God works with the yes. Some of you saying, I can't go on men's camp. I don't have the money. God works with the yes. Just put your name down saying, I'm going on camp. I don't care if you don't have the money. Trust God. Hello? Sometimes you've got to step out in faith and say, you know, it's when we step out that we find God is there for us. If we sit waiting for God to happen, nothing's going to happen. So we step out and say, okay, God, life's an adventure. You've called me. I'm your child. This is crazy. Let's go. Come on, church. Some of you got to do that. Some of you got to wake up and say, you know, I don't understand how it's going to work out, but I'm going to do it. God's calling you to do it. It's crazy, but do it anyway. This is your life. Plan something crazy. And somebody coming said, you know, my life is, 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 is a mess and I don't know what to do. I said, what do you love doing? They said, I love fishing. So I said, well, plan a fishing trip. They said, I, I don't have time to plan fishing trips. I said, you need a fishing trip. Next time I saw them, I said, did you, did you, have you put your dates down for the fishing trip? They said, no, not yet. I said, come on. Some of you, you need to do something crazy. One day I saw Granny playing volleyball. I said, Granny, what are you doing? You're crazy, man. Break a hip. She says, uh, you know, I only got one chance to play volleyball. This might be the last time I get it. So I'm playing volleyball. Do you remember that day, Granny? You remember? We get stuck in the mud, church. You know, Solomon has said life is meaningless. You know what gives life meaning? is when you realize life is an adventure. Stop being so stuffy and stiff and saying, oh, we can't. It's Zimbabwe. We can't do this. We can't do that. We can't plan. Just sometimes you've got to take a leap and say, Lord, this is my heart's desire. This is what I've been longing for, and I want to do something crazy for you. You know, God sometimes does it just because he can. He says, you want it? You got it. Because I can give it to you. Second thing is life is a gift. Enjoy it. Life is a gift. Enjoy it. Listen, look at the stars. I had guys talking to me about something happening in the stars yesterday. Hey, just stop and look at the stars for a minute. Watch a sunset. My daughter was on camp, Phoebe. She's 11. She came back. I said, did you enjoy camp? She says, it was amazing. We watched the moon rise. I'm like... Okay? She says, it's like a sunrise, but it's a moonrise. So I said, that's awesome. You know, how many of us have sat and watched the moonrise? Come on. Life is a gift. Friends, God is all around us, and He's longing for us just to see how beautiful every day is. How beautiful your marriage is. How beautiful your kids are. How beautiful Bulawayo is. I had a pastor here this week. I took him for breakfast. And he said, man, I was told that Bulawayo was falling apart. He says, your roads are better than our roads. 
It says, you, you've got a food lovers here. So I said, what's that? What's, you know? I said, who told you that? He says, the story's in Harari. They say Bulawayo is falling apart. I think I was with Nkosi, and he said, uh, the rumor mill's got it wrong, boy. Bulawayo has, is not dead yet. There's lots of life in us yet. Life is a gift. Enjoy it. Enjoy the moments you've got. The third one is life is a school. Learn your lessons. That's what Solomon teaches us. Life is a school. Learn your lessons. Listen, you've been bitten once. Don't go and do it again. You did something, don't just learn the lessons that God is teaching us. As a church, let's learn our lessons. It sounds so simple, sounds so easy, but we are just so sometimes. We need people to remind us. Do you remember you did this a little while ago? What happened then? Oh, it didn't turn out so well. Then why do you want to go and do it again? Just think twice. And the last one is life is a stewardship. Fear God. Life is a stewardship. God has given us stewardship over these things. We need to fear Him because why? One day we need to give an account for everything that we've done. He's given me my family. I have to answer before God for my family. He's given us this beautiful church, the people that are part of our lives. We've got to speak to God about how we've spoken into your life. God's given you a gift. Can I remind you? This year we discovered God has given us gifts. Hello? Every believer has a gift. Scriptures tell me if you're not using your gift for God's glory, how are people going to come to the kingdom? How are we going to extend His kingdom if we're not using the gifts God has given us? Even if it is cricket. It's nice to see you, my brother. Cricket is a gift. Whatever gift God has given you to do, do it well. Do it well. Because God is going to ask of us, what did we do with what He gave us? So in fact, Ecclesiastes calls for us very eloquently to live our lives with God's purposes in mind. I'd like to close with one more scripture, and it's not from the book of Ecclesiastes. It's found in Philippians chapter 4, reading verses 11 to 13. And Paul puts it this way. He says, For I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or an empty one, with plenty or with little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. So whatever you're going through today, you can do it. You can get through it. Life is going to throw you curveballs. Things are not going to work out the way you expected. Life is a mess, but it's a beautiful mess. And God says, let's enjoy this adventure of life. Every moment, breathe. God has given me a new day. Lord, what are your plans and purposes? Is life meaningless? No, of course not. He was asking the question because it seems that way. But when we open our eyes of faith, we see every day is connected to the next. And this is the day that He has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. It's my day. It's my time. It's my hour. It's my minute. It's my life. And God has given it to me. Every breath I take is yours, Lord. Every heartbeat that beats is yours, Lord. Let's live each day for Him. Quit your moaning. Quit your complaining. Life is going to get tough. But it's His gift it's His adventure. It's His lesson. It's His stewardship for us. Come on, church. God is calling us to step up and live life. Governments will come and go. People will come and go. But you only have this one life to live. And as long as we journey together, as long as we work together, we need to put passion back into our existence. Zimbabwe is like zombies right now, walking around. All dead. Walking dead. Come on, guys. The life of Christ is for us here and now.
today is the day. Some of you have got something to say to people. Like, I'm sorry. Do it today. Some of you have got some planning to do. To say, I'm going to do something crazy. Because I need a little bit of a break. But Lord, where's the money coming from? The Lord says, are you worried? Or are you going to trust me to do what I've called you to do? Some of you need to visit somebody you haven't seen in a long time. And just tell them, thank you for your friendship. Thank you for the part you've played in my life. I appreciate you. You're special to me. You know, if it weren't for you, my life would be in a different direction. All of us have got an adventure to live. One life to live. Let's live it for Jesus. Supernatural, all-encompassing, life-giving, oasis in the desert. Hallelujah, let's stand together. Come on, church. Thank you for joining us today. I know it took a while to get there, but that's because I had you thinking, is this sermon going to be meaningless? <laughs> Are we going to go over and over and over? But you know, God is faithful. And even the little things, can I say, even the little things like making breakfast for your family is a gift. Making a bed for a loved one is a gift. Making a cup of tea for somebody that's important to you is a gift. Let's not take the things we do for granted. Because I can tell you, when the ones we love go to be with Jesus, it's the little things they did we remember. The way they made the bed. The way they walked around the garden. The funny things they said. Those are the things we miss. We don't miss the hours they were sitting behind a computer. Hello? We don't miss the hours we sat watching television. Come on. Or, or, or doing work or whatever. We miss the way they used to cut their turkey or their chicken. And you used to argue about, hey, that's, that's not fair. How do you, why are you cooking it that way? That's the way you should do it. That pot doesn't go there. Listen, that's what you'll remember when they go. They always used the wrong pot. And the Nare family have come for prayer as well. Thank you for reminding me. Come to the front. Stay standing. Let's pray for them. Come and stand up here. In fact, t- just take a seat for a second, Kevin. Yeah. Come and stand up here. I know you're tall, but the guys at the back <laughs> can't. Yes. Your family people can come. Absolutely. Sorry, I'd, uh, they weren't here when we uh, started. So, um, can I have a microphone? Thank you. Taban, can you tell us where you're going for the next 10 months? Oh, okay. Um, thank you, Pastor Wayne. Um, Can I come, you? Mom. Oh. Tadas and Lodi, <laughs> please come. Um, where am I going? I'm going to Boston, Massachusetts. Um, but now that Pastor has given me the mic, I'll just testify for a minute. Ooh. Just one minute, half a minute. Half a minute. All right, very simple testimony. On the 1st of January 2016, around about 11.30, um, I stay in Morningside. Went to the Morningside shops. There was a man. He was drunk. He went in there and he bought a chibuku. It's called chibuku. It's called a super. It's a one liter. And he got to the till. And he was singing a song. And he was saying, when, God, when Jesus says yes, nobody can say no. So between me and the lady at the checkout counter, we were just amazed. This guy is drunk, obviously. New Year's Eve, he was drinking. He's now buying another uh, chibuku. He didn't just do that. He then went across the road. There are those uh, bus stops, uh, Rock, Rhodesia, Omnibus Company, Zubco. He went there, he sat down, and he had his chibuku. And he was saying, when Jesus says, yes, nobody can say no. You know, it was amazing. The long and short of it is uh, in May, um, the guys who are sponsoring me for the fellowship said no. And two weeks ago, they said yes. So that's the, that's the testimony. <laughs> Lord speaks to us in strange and wonderful ways. Life is an adventure. So um, 
Tabang's going to Boston for, for 10 months, so we're going to be missing him. And uh, Norma's staying here with the children. But he said, you know, I'd like to dedicate my children to the Lord. So I said, well, that's wonderful. Let's, let's, uh, th- that's his desire, is to bring his children before the Lord. So we'd like to pray for them. Uh, this is her. Okay, you can come and stand next to me. And he's so scared. I can never say his full Lebo. name. Lebo. Lebo. Let me just say Lebo. Do you want to say his full name for me? Lebo. Okay. So, Katlejo and Lebo. Connect group leaders to come. You Kevin want? and Tim. Oh, Kevin and Jenny. Oh, Kevin and Jenny. Hey, Kevin and Jenny. Yes, yes, they want you to come up as well. You are the connect group leaders, mom and dad. Come and join, please. Let me come down here. Come and stand with me. We're going to thank the Lord for these beautiful gifts. Aren't, these, aren't children a blessing from the Lord? Amen. Hey? Yes, they are. Hey, come and stand with me. Come. There we go. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray and thank the Lord for them. Uh, and then I'm going to ask Dad to pray a father's blessing. Because there's no greater privilege than allowing a father to speak into the heart of his children. Amen. And so Tabang's going to do that. And then we're going to stand as a surrogate dad for the next 10 months as mom stays home looking after the kids. Is that all right? Is that okay, mom? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank you. Thank you for coming and standing with the family and we pray together. Come and stand here with me. Yes, okay. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for these beautiful children. We want to thank you for Katlecho, Lord, and for what you've done in her life. And as she grows into the beautiful lady that you've created her to be, we thank you that you've given her life, that her life is in your hands. Thank you for the beauty that she has. Thank you, Lord, for the smile and for the way you're working in her heart to bring her closer to you. Lord, may she walk this journey of faith day by day, knowing that you are with her and you will never leave her or forsake her. She is a gift, a treasure from you. And we honor you and thank you for her. And for Lebo, Lord, thank you for him. Thank you, Lord, let him be a mighty warrior in your kingdom, a giant father. We thank you that he would speak words, the prophetic words over this nation, over people. Lord, that the words he speaks would bring life and healing to many. We thank you, Lord, that he will be a, 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 a giant in, in the spiritual realm, even as his dad is, is physically big. Lord, we pray that his presence would fill um, the place where he's in and that he would speak boldly your truth in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father, that you would lead him all the days of his life. Thank you that he's a gift from you. We pray for health for both of them, that they would stand strong in you. In Jesus' name I pray. And we dedicate them now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and set them aside for your plans and purposes for their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Tabang, if you'll pray for them and then I'll pray for them as a couple and we'll release them. Thank you. Dad okay. wants to pray for you. I'll pray for you. Come. Nare, uh, you're my daughter and I love you. I'm proud of you. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we just nullify, Lord, any word that's been spoken over Catholic life, Lord, that's not in conformity to your word, Lord. Yes, Lord. Le- Lord, may your word reign supreme in her life in the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name, Lord, every bondage is broken, every curse is broken through the blood of Jesus, Lord. Yes, Lord. She is free, free to serve you, free to love you. In the name of Jesus, Lord. God Almighty, we pray in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, because you have given Kasleho, you've given her beauty, you've given her grace, you have given her love, O oh God. Lord, we charge her, O oh God, in the name of Jesus today, O oh God, to follow your word in the name of Jesus as she lives her life, O oh God. To meditate on your word in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that in at an early age, Lord, she would know you. And she would acknowledge you as her Lord and Savior. That, Lord, she would make you known to men, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for Gatheo's healing, Lord. I pray for supernatural healing, O oh God. Yes, Lord. That you do something amazing in her life, Lord. You give her a testimony in the name of Jesus, Lord. Thank you, Father. God, I pray that Gatheo will be like Anna in the Bible, Lord. That she would abide in your temple, Lord. That she would seek your face and your presence in the name of Jesus, yes, Lord. Lord. Oh, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because you have given Kathle her creative hands, Lord. I pray that the work of her hands, oh God, will reach the nations 
In the name of Jesus, oh God, for the glory and for the honor of your name, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Kateho is an entrepreneur, Lord. She is a businesswoman. That's what you've made her to be, oh God. She's got these ideas. I pray those ideas will, will happen in the name of Jesus, Lord. In Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for wisdom, for discernment, for lifelong friendships and relationships, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord. Yes. Bless her in every way, oh God. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Lord, I pray for Lebo, the young man. Lebo, young man, I'm proud of you. You're my son. I love you dearly. Lord, thank you for Lebo. I pray in Jesus' name, every chain is broken. Yes, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Every word of discouragement is broken. Yes, in Lord. Jesus' name, your blessings are on his life, Lord. Thank you, Lord, because you've given Lebo wisdom. You've given him wealth. You've given him courage. You've given him influence, oh God. Yes, I pray in the name of Jesus that those gifts would be shown in his life, oh God. I pray for supernatural healing, oh God, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because Lebo's second name says he's a Caleb, oh God. He will go in and he will possess the land, oh God. Yes, Lord. He is a man of faith, oh God. He believes God's word and he acts on God's word, Lord. Yes, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord. Lebo, oh God, is a builder. He is a builder of relationships, but he's also a builder of buildings, of things, oh God. Bridges, whatever he wants to build, oh God. Make it happen. In the name of Jesus, we yes, pray. Lord. Lord, I pray that Lebo will speak before kings and they will hear in the name of Jesus. That Lebo is a giver, he's a philanthropist, Lord. He will give and he will be a blessing to his family, to the community, to the nation in the name of Jesus. He is wise. You have given him wisdom and he will serve you, oh God. He is a musician, Lord. He will play the, the musical instruments and bring glory and honor to your name. So, Lord, I thank you for Kasheho and Lebo. And thank you for this time that you have given us in Jesus' name. May your blessings endure. Yes, and may the blood of Jesus protect us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, Lord. And I'd just like to pray for the parents. Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. Amen. If you can stand there behind them. You can put your hand on their, on their shoulder as well. Yeah. Father, we thank you for Tabang and Norma. And we pray, Lord, and we charge you both to raise these children in the ways of God, that you would be the ones who pour uh, life over them and speak life and healing and that they would know you through your love for one another. We charge you to be vigilant and steadfast in the things of God and that you would create, Lord, a beautiful environment for these children that the seed would grow to the firm tree that you have planted in their lives. We thank you for grandparents and family that stand with them and are witnesses this day to the dedication of these children. May you bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Just hold us it. Amen. You know, the Word of God is powerful. And it's our responsibility as parents to speak into our children's lives. We can speak things. You know, some of you are sitting there saying, Whoa, can we do that? Yes, you can. Lord, I'm speaking life into my children. And it's not too late for you to start now. If you've never spoken into your children's lives, you start speaking. Even though they may not hear, you speak. Lord, I speak healing. I speak victory. I speak that they use their hands for your glory. So may this be a testimony of God's goodness in this family. And may it be a witness for you today to see what God will do in these children's lives. Let's give God the glory one more time as we stand together. Glad you're feeling better. Let's stand together. The worship team are going to lead us. Thank you, Taba. Travel safely, hey? Keep in touch. And Father, now as we go out, we pray that uh, your peace will follow us, that your joy will follow us, and Lord, that we would live supernatural lives. People will know that we are no longer slaves but children of the living God. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. This message was brought to you by Revival Center Ministries, Bulawayo.